Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jordan Malik, and this is Red Storm Arcade. I'm here with my co-host, Zachary Mahavir. And we are going to talk about some video games. First, news story of the day. Yes. Courtesy of IGN. A listing was spotted for a Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 remaster, suggesting Activision may be announcing a remaster of the title sometime soon. Now rumors are hinting that the game may be single player only. Charlie Intel and Eurogamer report sources confirmed to both outlets that the title will not have a multi multiplayer mode. As Charlie Intel points out, the listing on Amazon Italy is priced at $25 and con contrasted with the price of Call of Duty 4's Modern Warfare's remaster of $40, it would make sense that the game only offers a single player campaign at that price point. I think this is shockingly disrespectful to the fans of Call of Duty. Really? Why? Disrespectful. Because Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 has the best multiplayer of all of the Call of Duties. There were only two key flaws about it, and that was the setup of One Man Army, Danger Close, and uh, Grenade Launchers, and then they had the Commando Knights. Right. Those were the only issues with that game. Otherwise, it was flawless. I, I think with this, it's a pretty smart move because you don't want to commit any more server time, you know, if you're... Um, EA, it's EA that does Call of Duty, right? If you're oh, no, EA. Uh, Activision. Activision, right. If you're Activision, you don't want to commit any other server time to anything else. You don't want to commit too much resource to this. It's a nice little, like, it's, a, it's almost like, you know, like remasters are like ports. You know, mm -hmm. you just put them out there. It's supposed to generate hype, things like that. It's already accomplished half what it's supposed to do, putting the Call of Duty franchise back in the headlines. $25 as a price point also seems very reasonable for just one I I think of that type. I I agree with that that 25 is fair for a single player but also I'm worried about the single player being censored in a way because mm. I do not think that airport mission no Russian I don't think there's any way that that gets into a remastered version I think with, they leave it on with the way that the world is like I I wouldn't be shocked if they change it but at the same time I'd be annoyed but also I'd, I'd get it if they took it out. Because it's kind of like a read the room kind of thing. Yeah. Where it's like like airport shootings. like Yeah. yeah. It, so then that argues the question, is it even worth it to yeah. put out the port? Because there's a lot of stuff in Modern Warfare 2 that is like the airport mission. Or it is very like politically um, it nuanced. It is very politically nuanced. Where is it even worth putting it out? $25 is fine. Mm -hmm. Even if you just made like a multi a, a multiplayer only port for thirty five dollars or something like that, that'd be different. But this is yeah. the campaign throughout the various difficulties, assumedly for twenty five dollars. Like you said, they could easily take out the airport level. Is it even worth it? Yeah, like I, I don't think it would be at that point because that like unless they somehow completely rewritten the story, but then it's you get into like a false advertising kind of thing. Yeah. Where it's not Modern Warfare two anymore. Because you'd have to change the story in some way. Exactly. Or you're like, unless they just make it that like you see like a news report, but then that's just that's, just that's si a way. That's silly. It's a it's silly. It's, it's then you're gonna have to do that with half the missions basically. Yeah. Because going into the airport is a huge part of the storyline. It is because yeah. I think you go back to it and you're on the other side of things. If I'm correct. I think. Where you were not on Makarov's side, but you were a part of the response team. That sounds about right. I feel like I remember that. And if that's the case, then that's two whole missions that are very critical to the dynamic of the storytelling yes. that you now have to completely expunge. Because it also, it, it builds Makarov as this character where he's, like, this is at the very beginning of the game, like, where you go in, it's black screen, no Ru remember, no Russian, and just a crowd of people and four guys just left to right, like Scarface, yeah. just mowing people down. And like it's 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 a brutal scene, but it's meant to build up that this Makarov guy, he's insane. Like he does not have he any has, remorse. Yes. He's trying to make messages. And I think that even when you describe it like that, like this that entire scene is the whole point is to send a message about uh, Makarov's just hate and just capacity. Yes. I don't know if you put it in. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's appropriate. I don't know if it's it's right. They have a tough decision on their hands, but regardless, I feel like Activision will make 
there, there's no wrong move. They're just they're in between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Because they'll be respected if they take it out, but se if but then if they take it out, there's gonna be a lot of outcry. Then there's gonna be outcry if they leave it in. It's, yeah. There's no there's no ha win win. You, you don't. I don't think anybody really appreciates either decision because yeah. then people will say, well, what about this and what about that? Then if you leave it in, you try to make edits. I think leaving it in and making edits is worse than taking it out entirely mm -hmm. because then you're just rewriting the whole game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the $25 price point's really good. I'm excited to see what exactly a remaster is going to look like. It, it's, it's, it's a good move. It's a good move. It is. I, I'm s I might still buy it if it's just single player because I love the single player for that one. I think it's up there. It's definitely the best. Uh, Infinity Ward campaign, right? Because uh, I think Black Ops One and Two both had tremendous campaigns. They are the top, like they are the gold standard for campaigns in Call of Duty now. I don't remember. I, it's been a very long time since I played Call of Duty, uh, the the COD Modern Warfare Two campaign. I would definitely shell out twenty five dollars just to play it again. On to much brighter news. Yes. This is my favorite story of the week of recent news. Uh, via Polygon, several Nickelodeon series from the past two plus decades are headed to modern consoles. With help from THQ Nordic, the companies have partnered to bring back a number of games from the Nickelodeon catalog starting later this year, THQ, THQ Nordic announced. Here's the full list of Nickelodeon series whose games the company plans to re-release. Avatar The Last Airbender, Back at the Barnyard, Cat Scratch, Danny Phantom, El Tigre, Invader Zim, Jimmy Neutron, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Rocket Power, Rocco's Modern Life, Rugrats, SpongeBob SquarePants, Tack and the Power of Juju, The Fairly Odd Parents, The Ren and Stimpy Show, and The Wild Thornberries. I love this. I really, I love it really too. do. There are so many good games on here, and then this opens the door to so many other really good, like uh, Nickelodeon Party Blast. You can easily yes. do a remake of that. I think what's really important here is if you re-release the entire library, mm -hmm. you are now running the risk of everything being stacked up against each other because realistically, yeah. some of these aren't going to sell. Oh, at no. All. And some of these are going to sell really, really, really well. Do you re-release everything? Do you try to kind of gauge public opinion mm -hmm. and figure out which ones? And then some of these games, I own some of these games. Yeah, when I they still have release. some of them. Yeah. These games, <laughs> as much as I love them, were not the best mechanically yeah how much changes can they afford to make how many how many changes can they afford mm -hmm. to make before these releases where they're not re remaking the entire game but they're just re-releasing it they're bringing like a kind of a remaster almost mm -hmm. i am so happy thq is back because yeah. for the past few years there's been such a gap between the triple A's and the indies. Mm -hmm. There's been a big gap and like you've seen a few studios like Deep Silver which like they've kind of gone away now uh, but they've kind of started filling in the gap with, with Saints Row but even then like there's only so much they could do like but it seemed like it was all either exclusives or independent games. Yeah. And I'm glad that THQ is back and really trying to fill in the gaps again because some of the games that the Nickelodeon games that THQ helped publish were really just amazing standalone games yes that also happen to be Nickelodeon games which kind of hurt them in critical appeal but like Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom very good game very good game and it being a Spongebob game both hurt it and helped it it helped it its sales but hurt its critical appeal because it's, it's a Spongebob game you know yeah. I, and like, I remember Danny Phantom had a couple of GTA games and stuff did. like that. And I remember the Invader Zim game was super good. Jimmy Neutron is such a, it, it's such a powerful IP mm -hmm. to, to market off of. Oh, I remember yeah. the Avatar Last Airbender Wii game. I yes. loved that game so much. It was it was like an amazing like I think it had like ten or eleven hours of like playthrough time. Mm -hmm. So much fun. I would play that over and over again. Like, a lot of these games are good, and I'm, I'm, I want to see specific ones come back. Like, I want to see all of the SpongeBob games, at least. I would like to see a finished SpongeBob Return of the Flying Dutchman. I don't know if you remember that game. I think I do. It was a hot mess because it was got changed in between two studios, and the second studio closed right before uh, oh release. It was a 
garbage. It was a hot mess, just technically. So they shipped the. They shipped yeah, an they shipped an unfinished game. game. Like that was what happened. Oh but God. then a remaster of uh, or a remake of Battle for Bikini Bottom, and then there was also a really deep cut here, Light Camera Pants. I don't know if you remember that one. Was that a mobile? Was that like a mobile no. console? No, it was a it was a, P, it was a PS2. Uh, I do not PS2, remember Xbox, that. Game really? Huh. What it was, it was a bunch of mini games in a way, and they were all connected through this story of they're casting the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy movie, and you they they're auditioning for parts. I feel like I've seen game. I feel like I must have seen it in a magazine. It, I played it a lot. I've I've went back to play it a few times, and I still love it. Wow! Like it holds up technically. Like it's it's if they if they remade it, it would probably be like a twenty five dollar game. So it's like it's not that much yeah. to it. It's just mini games. Uh -huh. But it it was also always kind of fun because they're casting parts. So if you won the first segment, then your character, either SpongeBob Patch or whoever you pick, was casted at that part. <laughs> so I always really liked at the end. Because they played the full thing. Oh, my god! And it was just like, I would always pick Patrick. Patrick was playing, like, every single part. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny to me. And I just, like, I'm really excited for that. And I want to see a good Nicktoons Unite. That was another game. Nicktoons Unite it was, was super dope. It, it was awesome, but I went back and play it. And technically and mechanically, it does not hold up. It's like a lot but, of these games. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but I'm very hopeful with some good, like, if THQ can find some good promising studios, this could be an amazing move for them. It I, really could. I think that THQ, like you said, they're a good, like, gap between, like, the indies and the independents and, like, the triple A's and even, like, double A um, mm -hmm. producers where we're seeing they can do stuff on a reasonable budget. There's yeah. a feeling to the game where the play length's going to be good. Graphically, it's going to be right on par, maybe just a little under what a lot of AAA um, publishers and mm -hmm. developers are doing right now. What I think is really important uh, between the Nickelodeon THQ connection way back when was that it felt very Nick. It felt very like fun and vibrant and you know kitty. So I think that if they can maintain that and not try to focus too much on like perfecting these games, mm -hmm. this is a really this is going to be so much fun. I think this is also going to be big for Nickelodeon, too, because I don't know if you have ever seen a side-by-side -side of the Burbank studio in the 90s versus what it is now. No. The 90s picture, it was it was a bunch of colors. Like, it had, like, this, like, it had like a slime, but, like, the slime bucket logo over top. It was a bunch of orange and color and life to it, whereas now it's just a gray building. Like, it kind of shows the kind of de-evolution of Nickelodeon. It's kind of lost itself. Yeah. And I think this could be a great way in them getting back to that 90s and early 2000s of we have this character. We're not, like, we don't try to aim for the pre, like, preteen so much. We go for the kids and the adults. Yeah. We go for the, the parents with kids so that way they can get enjoyment out of watching the shows. That's why... SpongeBob holds up so well. Classic SpongeBob. Of course. I, yeah. I still think SpongeBob has some. I, th I think. I like its new quirks where it's just weird. I, mm, I don't I, know. As, about pers that. as personally, me, I'm a fan of Tim and Eric as well. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you're a fan of Tim and Eric? <laughs> so, so that's why it appeals to me. Mm -hmm. But, I, like, the old episodes help hold up so well because there's this weird dual target of children and adults. And it worked amazingly well, and I think they need to get back to that. And I think this is them kind of reshifting that. I, I just think it's such an odd. It really did show you which IPs were like had a lot yeah. of momentum way back when, because all of these had the warrant for a game. But then when you look at the staying power, like Back at the Barn or Cat Scratch, El Tigre, like these are tack and the power of Juju. Like these don't quite fit in with the likes of like a Rocket Power or a Danny Phantom or an yeah. Avatar where it's got where that got its own spinoff or the Wild Thornberries where it got its own theatrical release. Yeah. But that's gonna be even more interesting because when THQ does put these out again, those now have the opportunity to almost become like their own IPs again. Mm -hmm. Like these are now like just games. Yeah. Which is just games. really nice for, for the people working on them and for the IP itself. Yeah. More than anything, I just want a Rugrats re-release of Rugrats Scavenger Hunt. It was a, it was a Rugrats Mario Party. It was 
re I loved it as a uh, as a child, and I want it to come back. I just I watched videos of it the other day just to get <laughs> it back. I was like, I remember it looks terrible because it was an N sixty four game. They all didn't age well graphically. But. I want a reboot of Nick Party Blast yes. with the Avatar people and La, uh, Jenny for my teenage robot and everybody else, and they have like the gold level if you like unlock the secret opponent in things, and then you could like grab all types of, that came with such, like we've said. There's a said, lot of potential here. There's a potential for it to be good, and there's also potential for all the games to be a mess again. Mm -hmm. All righty, next news story, which is, doesn't pertain too much to games themselves, more of the industry itself. Uh, via Forbes, Ubisoft will not be taken over by Vindevi, the game publisher revealed today. For months now, the word on the street has been an impending hostile takeover of Ubisoft by Vindevi, a French media conglomerate that owned Activision Blizzard until the company spent $5.83 billion to gain its independence in 2013. Today, Ubisoft announced that it would buy out Vindevi's 27.3% stake in the company, a deal worth about $2.45 billion, or about twice what Vindevi paid originally. Now, this is big for Ubisoft because this has been a thing that's been happening for years yeah. where Vindevi was trying to buy it and completely take over and really sanction, uh, like, kind of create a monopoly specifically on the French media, uh, French video game industry because Ubisoft has a lot of French ties. That's why they, uh, their biggest studio is Ubisoft Montreal. Yes. Like, all of their best games have came out of there. Yeah. And... So this is big for Ubisoft because now they're going to be independent and they're going to be able to take a little bit more risks and they can do what they want to do. Uh, granted, comparing it to Activision Blizzard might not be the best thing because 2013, I believe that was also the year Skylanders came out, which granted that's made them a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's made certain, them look certain, bad. certain parts of that IP made them a lot yes. of money. I don't know about the game itself. It was more the yeah, action the figures. figures. Yeah, yes. the figures made them a lot of money. Yeah. I think this is a good move on the whole. As a production company, it's good because Ubisoft has had the ability to create a really nice range of IPs. They've had the opportunity to work with you know, Ubisoft Montreal, like you said, lots of really great games have come out of there, and lots of really talented people have been able to kind of make that their entryway into the North American region, mm -hmm. because this is really where you want to be if you want to get like nice, consistent work. Sticking around in Europe or um, you know the Asian market too long, you start to get um, lapped over for certain opportunities and development. Mm -hmm. What I think is a rough move here is I don't know how much Ubisoft has in um, liquid capital, but 2.45 billion a lot of money. is a lot of money. Activision Blizzard is a huge, even with parent, even when it did have a parent company, it was huge, mm -hmm. beyond belief, yeah. astronomical. Because this was also when Call of Duty was at its peak. Yeah, so they had the money lying around. I guess it was really just a when do we want our way out. With Ubisoft, it's always been hit and miss. Sales yeah. have always been very questionable. They've never been bad per se, but it's like where's they they Where's the consistency coming in? They have gotten a chain of, I think, the past three games they've released have been pretty big hits. The Far Cry 5 has been getting amazing reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, Mario and Rabbids. Uh, that is that's Ubisoft been getting IP, amazing yeah. reviews. It looks amazing. I'm just not poor. I'm poor enough. <laughs> I can't buy it. I want, that's my next one. Oh my uh, and then also they had uh, Assassin's Creed. Yes. Uh, Assassin's Creed. It was in Egypt. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, if I can't... Origins? Is it Origins? Yes, okay. Origins. Assassin's Creed Origins. That was a big hit, too. Like, they've they've been stringing along a good, like, six... They, they've had a good past two years. And it definitely did help that they took a break, break from Assassin's Creed because they kind of... They releasing they released two in one year. It was a little bit of oversaturation, and also the studios not getting enough time to make it. They that felt very. They, they were rushing them out, basically. They were rushing them out. It was yeah. very systematic, kind of something that was happening with Call of Duty, and then now they kind of got this third studio in, and now it's been shuffling things up a little bit. We won't really see it until how much it's affected them until these next two or three, or next one or two with Black Ops Four and then the following one, but. It's very big for Ubisoft that they got their independence. It's going to be 
very good for the game industry as a whole as well because there won't be any kind of monopoly it helps the globalization of video games you know I, I think every, anytime I hear anything about just um, somebody taking over somebody else or somebody buying out of this the last two or three years I always get a little nervous because economically this has been a very weird time in the gaming yes. industry because of the takeover of the PC we have so many um, you know, peripherals now and just extensions like VR mm -hmm. and, you know, handhelds and things like that where companies choosing to shift around their assets or to use liquid capital on buyouts or heavy investments like this, it is always a big risk yep. because they are now banking on this investment being supported by major releases like Assassin's yeah. Creed Origins and Rabbids, just like how Activision Blizzard was able to confidently make decisions because of how well Call of Duty was doing, and then even down the line now, they're, they're just fine. Yeah. It really is up to Ubisoft now. The only way to tell if this is a good decision is not how good the next games are, it's if they can maintain uh, those high levels of distributions yes. without a parent company. Yes, that's very, very true. Alrighty, fourth no news story of the day, uh, via Eurogamer. PlayStation 4 Motorbikes and Zombies game Days Gone, which pops up in conferences but never seems to get much further, has been pushed to 2019. We can confirm that Days Gone will be releasing in 2019, Sony told Eurogamer in a statement, uh, and we will keep you updated on the launch date. I think this is very predictable because it's they've never shown that much and we're already a a quarter, we're almost a quarter of the way into 2018. Yeah. I didn't see this coming. I'm still now worried that, because Days Gone is so similar to The Last of Us, and more, speci more specifically, The Last of Us Part Two. Does that mean that Last of Us Part Two doesn't get released until 2020? I, it's, it's worrisome, but Days Gone looks amazing. Uh, Sony Bend, the studio behind it, they haven't done much, but what they have done has been exceptional. They made one of the best uh, PSP Vita games in Siphon Filter and also Uncharted Golden Abyss. They are both oh. amazingly underrated too. Yeah. And it's just, they're underrated because of the nature of the consoles. They never really took off as much as they wanted yeah. to because the 3DS is just so much better. It is. <laughs> uh, but it looks amazing. It seems to also have a different take on a different focus, whereas. Uh, Last of Us was this father-daughter relationship, uh, and then Days Gone, we're kind of getting this more somewhat family, but not f uh, father-daughter, more so kind of like the Walking Dead games, where it's like you get attached to these strangers, and they become your brother, and you're like, yeah. you know, more than just a father-daughter. It's a little bit more complex. There's a that. dynamic there. My thing about this game is that it, it's, I, we've been hearing stuff about this since, since like when, like 2017? Stuff like that. I want to say so. I think it was released like really at PlayStation Experience of 2017, which is December. Yeah. I want to say that. To me, it's like if this is the move now, this not going to bode well later on. This is so early mm -hmm. in 2018. We're only in March. If we get past E3 and there's no new updates, no new yeah. screenshots and new visuals, the game, I'm not going to say that the game is dead and the game is gone, but this is. It doesn't bode well that we're this far out from E3 and they're choosing to make these announcements. Yeah, well, I think I still think there's a shot of it being an early 2019 release because it seems that PlayStation has this focus on the right before summer. Yeah. Because we see God of War coming out <laughs> in just under a month. Uh, we have uh, Detroit Become Human coming out May 25th, right. which is, again, right before summer. So it seems like they're being very strategic with when they release games, uh, especially with uh, Black Friday and whatnot. I think that's when Spider-Man's gonna be a release, is Black Friday. Uh, so I think that Days Gone, this could also, just may have been more of a marketing thing where it's just like, okay, we'll push it to uh, either February, which, January, February, which is traditionally a dead month for video games or so that way it can capitalize more, or it's just a technical thing where it's just like it wasn't going to be ready, and it's worrisome if that's the case. Because yeah. games always take longer than we think. It really does feel like more of like a technical, like a readiness thing. I, I, I just don't see, you know, from what I've seen from the game, like back in December, like I don't know what could be taking so long. But again, I'm not in the mm -hmm. room with them, but I just, it doesn't bode well. It's the timing is what feels very funny. Yes, and I'm 
just so worried of Last of Us Part Two taking away a bunch of audience from this game and taking away a lot of dollars, yeah. especially with a studio so talented like Sony Bend. It makes me worried, but I do trust them because Sony has been very on, they've been on their game so well. They've been on the ball so well that I still, ha I still believe in it. I still have trust in it. Yeah. Alrighty. And our final news story of the day uh, from Eurogamer. Amid the astonishing rise of free-to-download Battle Royale game Fortnite, Epic, ha Epic announced its other game, free-to-download MOBA Paragon, would close down on the 26th of April after it failed to find an audience. Now Epic has said the $12 million worth of Paragon assets will be free to all developers to use with the Unreal game engine, which opens up Paragon's character models, animations, environments, VFX, and dialogue related to all of the game's 20 heroes to appear in other titles. There are over 1,500 environment components and a sample map to tinker with, too. This is an awesome news story. I love it that Epic is doing this. I think it's just nothing but good press. Most people will just read it and not yeah. care about it. Because it's like, oh, it's, I thought I saw Epic Games in the headline. I thought it was going to be about Fortnite. Exactly. But Paragon, which it looked promising uh, when it came out a few years ago, or it was it was in this like open beta kind of thing for a while. It was rather confusing from the outside looking in. Uh, but releasing twelve million dollars worth of assets to just give away, and tell people just like, yeah, use them. Like we don't care. Like. It's an awesome move, especially for people who are just getting into the game industry, these indie studios and whatnot. That's awesome for them. It's amazing goodwill. And, you know, what's really important when you look at these hyper-competitive games like Fortnite, just like PUBG, mm -hmm. just like, you know, anything with an eSports um, background to it, yeah. is that moves like this help that core audience. Like you said, the casual gamer doesn't care about this. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, it's just about some other thing that Epic put out, the people, the Fortnite people put out. But what this does is it establishes that Epic understands what they really have with Fortnite. They've already yes. garnered this huge audience. There's no need really to just hold on to this to these Paragon assets. And what I find really interesting about this is they're releasing literally everything. The 1500 environment components and the sample yeah. map are really good for modders. This is going to establish a lot of inventory for people that make mods, even people potentially making Fortnite mods right now. Yeah. Because I don't know if that game has an open source component to it right now, but if and when that becomes more accessible to modders, this is absolutely perfect. Yes, this is a great move from them, and I wouldn't be surprised if Epic Games is thinking in their back of the head. We saw what happened with Gary's mods all those years ago, yeah. where this could be another move by Epic where they're just killing it, and they end up making another boatload of money by giving people like things to just use for free in return for, or like giving things for people to use and for people to play in the sense of Fortnite, and just kind of relying on kind of goodwill. Like you know, they give the skins, and it's just like, oh, okay, I'll buy a skin. Most yeah. people don't think of it as just like I'm giving that money to Epic. Uh, but that's still like how it works. That's the only money they're making from that game is from the skins, from the v, v bucks that you're buying, from the battle pass that you buy. And it's awesome that they're kind of just because Paragon costs a lot of money too. It did. It, like yeah. just to develop the assets alone are 12 million. That doesn't account for salaries that they had to pay, advertising, and all that other stuff. They worked on the game for over like a couple years. Yeah. It was a very big project for them at the time, and I think it was their primary project before like Fortnite was really a couple it months was. in. Which is, you know, and, and great for them for finally being able to rely on one IP, but it, it's an emotional burden for developers. You know, we were very creative people. They really understand the power and, and magnitude behind their assets to just be like, we're giving it away. Like, yeah. it's just, it's not worth, it's, it's not a, worth it. It's, it's awesome of them because it's, it just helps everyone so much. And I'm very happy that Epic had decided to do that. Alrighty, and we're going to end the show on one little discussion point. As of right now, it is March 22nd. That means it is less than one month until God of War's release on April 20th. And God of War looks to be the most promising and technically impressive PlayStation 4, to, PlayStation 4 game to date, 
I am incredibly excited for it. It looks amazing, and they've brought this new flavor to God of War. They modernized it. God of Wars 1, 2, 3, and Ascension all had a locked camera. Yeah. So if you've ever played the old Silent Hills, that's what it was, where camera was perched, and you just had to work with that yeah, yeah. from scene to scene to scene. Right. Whereas now they're giving you a third-person camera, and it's amazing. And this game is getting so much hype, and I'm very, very, very excited for it. I love everything around it. The Norse mythology is so fresh. Greek mythology is a little overplayed, I feel, just in general life. <laughs> right. No one ever, <laughs> Norse mythology never gets any attention. I, I've never been a fan of the God of War uh, franchise. Mm -hmm. I was actually talking about somebody earlier today. I just found that the art style is very, mm -hmm. I don't know, blocky and grim. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big person on lighting and feel yeah, for a game. Yeah, it's a very grim game. It's it, very dark, a lot of grays. Yeah. A lot of grays, not very, uh, very in hues, and even just in thematics. I think that what they're doing with this approach it's giving me the opportunity to give it another chance. I, I, it's different enough where I, I know it's God of War, it feels like God of War, it looks like God of War, but I think that Norse mytho mythological focus is a really good move, like you said. Greek mythology is <laughs> so overplayed. It's had its day. In everything. It's had its like last 50 years <laughs> of mass media circulation. And I think that in general, like what's, what's the studio working on God of War right now? Uh, Sony Santa Monica. I think that's a great studio as well. I think that they have yeah. a lot of potential. It, it, it's, it feels like it's not going to be a disappointment. It might not be the best thing, but it feels mm -hmm. like it's going to be something. It's definitely going to be a lot of fun. Like I, like God of War games have always kind of relied on that. Like the first four, the first major four, they were this hack and slash where it's kind of like you just shut your brain off in combat. You mash square, throw through triangles in, and yeah. like the occasional circle grab. Yeah. Like, but this combat seems to actually like make you think it's a lot weightier, it's a lot heavier. Where in the first four, it was just going nuts, like just mashing X really fast with Kratos's uh, blades of Sparta. Whereas now he has this axe, and it's really heavy, it's really weighted, and it seems like by watching videos, I can already tell that it fe it's gonna feel good when I'm the one doing it. Like it's just gonna feel like there's gonna I be that satisfaction yes. behind handling it. Yeah, like when I'm throwing axe at someone, I feel like I'm going to feel like the recoil of it and the impact of it. <laughs> and I'm very excited for it. It looks absolutely beautiful, too. I thought, like, Horizon Zero Dawn, I thought was, like, the peak. At, like, that was the peak when that came out of yeah. what could be achieved graphically in video games. I think God of War is going to break that. That's what it looks like as of now. I think they've also done a lot of savvy technical things. I've noticed that throughout a lot of the game, it's a very foggy game from what I've seen in when there's the vast landscapes, uh, or very open landscapes, I should say. And I think they do that to kind of hide what they, so that way they can have what is visible be more in detail and whatnot, basically. Mm -hmm. So hiding what doesn't need to be seen so that way they can have more focus and a better draw distance and whatnot. And I think it's that kind of creativity which has been helping Sony exclusives so much. Because it has lately been, it hasn't been since games were on cartridges that game creators have had to been especially savvy with things right. in order to get extra room. Yeah. And it seems like we're finally starting to get there again. I'm really happy about that. It's starting to get more evident with how much they're able to do with so little. Like, yeah. on just one disc with maybe, like, 40 gigabytes of, a like, a download. I, I almost think it's the opposite, where, like, we're seeing that savvy, but in, in a different light, where there's a lot of space for these devs to work with now. Oh, yeah. And they finally get it. Because for so long, I think it's something that ailed um, the early release of the PS3, it oh, ailed yeah. a lot. It, it was a huge ailment, and it was basically the death of the Wii U, where there was this amazing peripheral, there was this amazing amount of space, amount of potential, and people d weren't able to tap into it. Yeah. Even as someone, like I said, I don't like God of War. I think it's a, I, I, I think it's a weak IP. It's still a lot of stuff in there, and if it's somebody's introduction to the franchise, it's full of stuff to do. It's full of amazing graphics. It, it obviously has a different uh, mechanical sense to it. And I think they're really taking advantage of the fact that the, the PS4 has so much more to offer now and so much more to program on that developers are finally like really 
tuning in to how much space, how much capacity they have. These past two years have been all about, I feel like the theme has just been growth about the hardware more than anything. We've now been able to see what the difference was between the PS3 and the PS4. Mm -hmm. Because there's always those games where like the PS4 launch titles, they like they're fringy. Like, you know, it's like, oh, I feel like I could imagine this on a PS3. Like it's not like you don't get blown away by it. Yeah. Just like, oh my God, this is not, like I think now we are at that point where like this is the new generation right now and it's only starting to where things are constantly being blown out of the water. And I am also very excited for the story element of uh -huh. God of War. God of War has never really had a strong story. Kratos has always been a very shallow character. He's always been angry because of trauma, and like that was all he is. He just ki like he kills for revenge, and then that's his whole character. Right. Whereas now we have this child that we don't even know his relation to. Like it doesn't seem to be any direct connection, and it's very strange. And it's really interesting because I feel like the little duo thing is getting a little played out. Right. But I still feel like they can have a very unique approach to it because it seems like there's a lot of conflict between the two. Like you've seen in the one trailer, uh, Kratos telling, uh, telling him, you don't want to fight a god. You don't know what they can do. And he's just screaming out, how do you know? How do you know? And he like grabs him up real close and it's like that was a cut away. But it seems like this is going to be an actually dramatic God of War game, which I feel hasn't really ever been. It's, it, it felt very like hammy, it felt very a little tongue, tongue in cheek. Yeah. Where it's like it's trying to take itself seriously, but it hasn't. And I think you know, this is a chance for it to really get it taken is. seriously. Alrighty, that's all that we have for you today on Red Storm Arcade. I'm Jordan Malik, and I'm Zach Mahabir, and we will see you guys next time.